everyone. Happy Sunday. This is Sunday, April 14. We want to thank everyone here for joining us for this next session of The Guardian. We are so happy to have all of you here today, and especially Ms. Violetta Zane. Ms. Violetta is an artist and a graphic designer living in pointe noire in the Republic of Congo and is the co-founder with Adib Masumian of The Utterance Project. Violetta is also a researcher, a writer, and a presenter on Baha'i history. She has given over 50 talks on the Clearwater Baha'i's YouTube channel and is the author of four online illustrated chronologies on the lives of Baha'u'llah, the Bab, Abdul Baha, and Shoghi Effendi. All links and details can be found in the description below this video. We definitely recommend if you like this video and you haven't watched the ones before, please save the playlist. And we hope you can join us on this journey from where we're leaving off today. Violetta, we're so happy to have you. And of course, we're so grateful for Immersive Ocean uh, and, and the Clearwater Baha'is for bringing this as a venue. Thank you, Violetta, again. Welcome. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And I see okay. a big Zoom icon. Right. Okay. You're that's on the Zoom. Let me just adjust the portion of my screen I'm going to share. So we see The Guardian, part six, years yes. 1922 to 1924. Yep, that's it. So last week, we looked at part five, Shoghi Effendi Becomes the Guardian. This part is the next two years in Shoghi Effendi's life, two very momentous years where Shoghi Effendi is going to be the guardian despite all these elderly veteran Baha'is who think they know better than this 24-year-old young man. He's going to be the guardian as he establishes the Baha'i Fund. He's going to be the guardian as he sets directive lines and calls a consultative meeting. And it's going to be very exciting. There's a lot of exciting things that are happening in this part. So without further ado, the guardian part six, 1922 to 1924, the state of the worldwide Baha'i administrative order. This part covers the life of Shoghi Effendi from the age of 25 in 1922 to the age of 27 in 1924. This is a photograph of Shoghi Effendi taken from the Priceless Pearl. This section is called simply the guardian. Shoghi Effendi is now the guardian. Guardian is not a strong word in English. The Arabic original term for guardian is vali amrullah. And it is a beautiful, it is a rich, it is a precise evocative term, which means at the same time, defender of the faith, leader and commander in chief. Baha'u'llah's will and testament had placed on Shoghi Effendi's shoulders the same responsibility which the Kitabi Ahd, Baha'u'llah's will and testament, had placed on his own shoulders. The responsibility of the guardian, and I am going to repeat this twice, the responsibility of the guardian, his infallibility as the interpreter of Baha'u'llah's holy scripture, cannot could not, would not ever be delegated to another person. Nothing the guardian did could be delegated because he was invested with infallibility in all matters regarding the faith. And this is why he worked for 36 years, sleeping four hours a night, working 20 hours a day, and suffered various levels of constant burnout throughout his entire ministry. It's 
extremely important to understand the pressure of a job, of a calling, of a position, of a station that cannot be delegated, even in its slightest details. After he became the guardian, Shoghi Effendi made two simple changes to his wardrobe. He stopped wearing a Turkish style fez, which is this type of hat. And he, he began wearing a Persian style fez, a black one. And he adopted a knee length coat. The four aspects of Shoghi Effendi's life that hand of the cause Amatul Baharuhiya Hanum, who was married to the guardian for 20 years, synthesized for us in The Priceless Pearl, are on the first, on the one hand, his translations and writings. Two, the uninterrupted stream of instructive communications that he sent out to the Baha'i world. 38,000 letters at the last count. The third aspect of Shoghi Effendi's life is expanding and consolidating the properties of the faith, both in the Holy Land and abroad. And the fourth, very interestingly, that Ruhiya Hanum isolates is an orderly classification of the teachings of the faith. Just as Abdul Baha before him, had three self-imposed aims to his ministry. Abdul Baha gave himself three tasks, three aims, three objectives. The first was the establishment of the faith in North America. The second was the erection of the house of worship in Ishabad. And the third one was the uh, interment of the Bab's remains on Mount Carmel where Baha'u'llah had indicated. Shoghi Effendi also had three aims for his ministry. And this is something he confided to Leroy Ios. These are also self-imposed aims to the Guardian's ministry. The first one was developing the Baha'i administrative order. From now until part 20, for the next 14 parts, you have to pay close attention to the incremental changes and developments that the Guardian is going to steer the entire Baha'i world in, in his development of the administrative order. We're going to cover one of the most important parts of that later on in this part. The second self-imposed aim of Shoghi Effendi's ministry, as he saw his own guardianship, was prosecuting the tablets of the divine plan. We're going to put that on hold for the next 13 years. This is going to start in 1937. The year that Shoghi Effendi marries, Ruhiya Hanum, is also the year, coincidentally, that he is going to start prosecuting the tablets of the divine plan, the ones that Abdul Baha revealed and sent to North America. And his third self imposed aim for his ministry is establishing the Baha'i World Center. Before 17th January 1922, Shoghi Effendi's first laugh, I searched high and low for a photograph of Shoghi Effendi la laughing. This is the first time he laughs. Two months after Abdul Baha dies, this is the first time he laughs. So John and Louise Bosch, American Baha'is, had arrived on pilgrimage on the 13th of November 1921, and they were there for everything. They were there for the illness of Abdul Baha, the passing, the funeral, the month waiting, Shoghi Effendi's arrival, the reading of the will and testament. And before leaving Haifa, Louise Bosch, she wanted to buy the regular Eastern clothes that women wore in, 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 uh, in the Holy Land. So <laughs> she wanted to show her respect to the Holy Family by dressing like local women. So once she wore the, uh, the Eastern clothes, she walked into the room where the women of the Holy Family were. And one of the guardian's aunts told Louise Bosch, you must go and see Shoghi Effendi. So that now that she was going to see Shoghi Effendi, all of a sudden Louise Bosch started to feel like she was playing dress up. You know, she felt a little bit silly. But she entered Shoghi Effendi's room and she stood about a meter away from his bed. Shoghi Effendi sat up in bed and he didn't quite 
realize at first who he was looking at. And Louise started laughing. She couldn't contain her laughter at the confusion of the guardian. And Shogi Effendi recognized her from her laughing. He said, oh, it's Mrs. Bosch. And he pointed to her shoes. She hadn't obviously changed her shoes. And he said that's how she had recognized her. And the whole family realized, family realized that this was the first he had left since he arrived on 29th of December, 1921. So... The same day, a little bit after that, on actually on 17 January 1922, there has been no mistake. John and Louise Bosch left after two months of pilgrimage on the 17th of January 1922. They went to see Shogi Effendi to say goodbye, and the Guardian's last words to them were very profound. He looked at them and he said, tell the friends... Time will prove there has been no mistake. For the Guardian's last words to an American couple going back to America to be, tell the friends time will prove that there has been no mistake. You have to really anchor in your mind that people were thinking that there had been a mistake. This is what the Guardian is dealing with at the beginning of his ministry. A week later, on the 23rd of January, or four days later, on the, on the 23rd of January, Shogi Effendi writes his first letter to Ali Yazdi as guardian of the cause of God. This is the last uh, real communication that he's going to have with Ali Yazdi, his childhood friend, until Ali Yazdi comes on pilgrimage in at least 10 years later. The Guardian replied to Ali Yazdi's, who had written him a letter and called him my dearest brother. And he talked about how touching his letter was. And uh, he assured him of his prayers at the holy shrines. And then he says, I'm too overwhelmed to write more fully but I assure you of my prayers for you, my attachment to you, and my fervent hope that we shall both cooperate to the very last in our servitude to the holy threshold. And the guardian had the thoughtfulness of enclosing in his letter to his childhood friend Ali Yazdi an envelope on which he wrote rose petals that have been laid upon his sacred threshold. They would not see each other until seven years from now when Ali Yazdi came on pilgrimage with his wife, Marion Carpenter. But I want to just give you one tiny little insight into the difference between Shogi Effendi and The Guardian. Shogi Effendi could have a best friend. He could have a best friend he wrote to every week. He could have a best friend that came to visit him in Oxford and hung around and talk about talks and exchange intimate letters. This is, I think in terms of Ali Yazdi's memoirs, this is the last letter he shares from the guardian to him. The guardian can't have best friends. So he's in this position where he can't delegate anything and he can't have intimate relationships or friendships. He can't show preference. February 1922, bitter remorse. This is just a section I wanted to put in the chronology because I wanted you to understand how much the disobedience of Abdul Baha's family to send a cable to Shoghi Effendi weeks before his passing and send a letter instead that arrived after Abdul Baha had died the bitterness of the anguish that that caused Shoghi Effendi for the rest of his life. He wrote to a distant cousin and said, ah, bitter remorse of having missed him, Abdul Baha, in his last days on earth. I shall take with me to the grave, no matter what I may do for him in the future, no matter to what extent my studies in England will repay his wondrous love for me. 
this sorrow is going to become an integral part of who the guardian is. And he's going to carry that to the grave. Nothing will ever ease that pain of having missed Abdul Baha. This section on the agony and grief of Shoghi Effendi, I invite you to discover on your own in the chronology. I have a lot to cover today, so I'm going to skip it. Early March, April 1922, a place for Abdul Baha's shrine. Now, I want to introduce you to one of these anchor books that I used and is from my, my mentor in Baha'i history, the person who got me interested in Baha'i history nearly six years ago, Earl Redman, whom I am privileged to call a very close friend. Earl Redman has written many, many, many books, many books. He's written a trilogy on Abdul Baha and this book, Shoghi Effendi Through the Pilgrim's Eye, is covers the first 30 years of the Guardian's ministry from 1922 to 1952. And it covers um, everything that happens in the Guardian's life from writing the Dawnbreakers to the development of the administrative order. This work was very crucial in the writing of this chronology because no one so far, other than Earl Redman, has aligned as many dates as possible. And I am obsessed with dates because, of course, I write chronologies. So all of these pilgrims that are looking at Shoghi Effendi through the pilgrim's eye, they have dates for their pilgrimages. And Earl, if you ever watch this, thank you. I love you. Thank you for writing this amazing book. I, I loved it. I slept with it. It was my constant companion. So between 1922 and 1924, we're going to see uh, Shoghi Effendi very occupied with uh, the Most Great House of Baghdad. This is a story that is going to continue over the next several parts. This gorgeous photograph on the left here is actually, this is what the Most Great House looked like. It was filled with color. Everything you see in these black and white photos is not black and white, my friends. The walls are yellow. The, the engravings are turquoise. The columns are green. It's, it's just a feast of colors, just like this, uh, the entrance. That's exactly what the color scheme looks like on the inside. It was like a jewel. It's really like a jewel. And, um, that photograph was taken by a very good friend of mine, an Iraqi Baha'i called Saad Salim, and he gave me permission to use it in the chronology. So this is the most great house in Baghdad. And it was decreed by Baha'u'llah and the Kitabi Akta as to be one of the two sites of pilgrimage with the holy house of the Bab in Shiraz. Baha'u'llah lived in the most great house for seven years while he was in Baghdad. He revealed the seven valleys there. He revealed the Kitabi Iran there. He revealed the four valleys there. Um, and it was sort of like a center for the Babi community. There were only about 40 Babis in Baghdad at the time of Baha'u'llah. And Baha'u'llah was very, very social in Baghdad. It was the only place in his life where he was really social. He would go out to cafes for three hours a day and constantly teach the faith and was always mixing with the Iraqis. And he loved them with all his heart, especially the, the Kurd Kurdish Iraqis. Um, in 1921, uh, Abdul Baha, in the last year of his ministry, uh, allowed for Baha'is to start making repairs. But when the custodian of the house died, the house fell into the hands of the Shia of Baghdad. And in 1921, the Baha'is were illegally evicted. So the Shia sued for ownership and the Court of Appeals gave them ownership of the house. And uh, to a year a year later, the government of Iraq handed the Shia the keys to the holy house in Baghdad. Um, but on the 20th of December, 1923, the peace court was, was a, I'm sorry, ruled in favor of returning ownership to the house to the Baha'is. So the Council of Ministers of Baghdad ordered a stop to the decision. So this is very confusing. 
the Baha'is have the house, the Shias take it, then they get the keys, then they get ownership, then the peace court gives ownership to the Baha'is, but the Baha'is don't get the keys. And this situation is going to go on for years, and it's going to be extremely frustrating for the Guardian. But this is the introduction to the house in Baghdad. Now, those of you who have a video, have you ever seen this picture of Shoghi Effendi before? Yes? Yeah. Do you know the story behind this photograph? There is a story behind this photograph. What is he holding? I'm going to tell you. So one day in early 1922, Shoghi Effendi walked back to the house of the master at Seven Haparsim after a visit to the shrine of the Bab, and he was followed by some Baha'is. When he arrived at the house of the master, Shoghi Effendi invited Boyce Norris, a young pilgrim in Haifa, with his family to stroll with him through the garden of the house of Abdul Baha. Boyce asked Shoghi Effendi if he could take his photograph, and Shoghi Effendi agreed. This is the photograph, the first real photograph of Shoghi Effendi as guardian of Baha'i faith. It's on uh, the website Baha'i Media Bank. The photograph shows Shoghi Effendi standing in the garden of Abdul Baha's home, holding a handkerchief. Inside the handkerchief, that white bit that you see here, inside are violets that Shoghi Effendi had picked and he was going to bring it back for his beloved great aunt, the greatest holy leaf. But he also picked a second bouquet of violets that he gave to Boyce Norse's mother, Elizabeth Norse, to bring back with her to America. These violets that he gave to Elizabeth Norse were the very first gift of the guardian to America. They were preserved and they are currently in the United States National Baha'i Archives. So you see just a simple picture of our beloved guardian and uh, we have such a story to go behind it. And this story uh, is, is uh, from Earl Redmond's amazing book. That's why I really uh, encourage you to read it because it's filled with treasures. So on 5th of March, 1922, the Guardian writes a letter to the Baha'i world addressed to the fellow workers in the cause of Baha'u'llah. This is another aspect of the Guardian. The Guardian was not a patriarch, and the Guardian considered himself a fellow worker in the vineyard of Baha'u'llah. That is why he signed all his letters, your true brother, because he was brother in arms with everyone who was working in the field. And he was with them in spirit every moment of his life, even though he could not participate in community activities because he was the head of the faith. The first part of this long March 5th, 1922 letter sets forth the primary aim of the Baha'i faith, its propagation throughout the world. And we hear the voice of the guardian so confident. How great is the need at this moment when the promised outpourings of his grace are ready to be extended to every soul for us all to form a broad vision of the mission of the cause of God to mankind. The mission of the cause is to spread. Then Shoghi Effendi addresses local and spiritual assemblies. And this is going to be an ongoing theme for the next 14 parts of this chronology. He calls it the vital necessity of having a local spiritual assembly in every locality where the number of adult declared believers exceeds nine. In March, 1922, really interesting event happens. A very interesting event happens for us now because we are now building, all of us contributing and building a shrine for Abdul Baha that is located on the Ark between Haifa and Akka. But in March of 1922, the Guardian made a trip to a strip of beach 
somewhere around in the general vicinity of where we are now building the shrine. And I chose this picture because this picture is Abdul Baha sitting in his carriage on his way back from Bahji along the beach because the story is, uh, takes place shortly uh, away from the beach. A hundred years ago, Shoghi Effendi could already see the place where Abdul Baha's shrine would finally be. Accompanied by Mason Rimi, who would later break the covenant after Ab uh, Shoghi Effendi's passing, but was a faithful believer at the time. He was a very well-known American architect. He decided to uh, invite this uh, capable man and capable architect with him. He had come to participate in consultations, which we're going to cover in the next story, I think. So at one point during Mason Remy's stay in Haifa, shortly before his departure, Shoghi Effendi seized the opportunity to consult with him on a, on a couple of different things, um, such as the future shrine of Baha'u'llah, the superstructure of Baha'u'llah, and the, the temple on Mount Carmel, and the terraces of the Shrine of the Bab, and the three extra rooms that Baha'u'llah had asked to be added to the Shrine of the Bab, who had five rooms, it needed eight rooms. So you see one year into his guardianship, not, not just a few months, four months into his guardianship, Shoghi Effendi is already making plans for the superstructure of the Shrine of Baha'u'llah, the Shrine of Abdul Baha, the temple on Mount Carmel, and the extra rooms to the Shrine of the Bab. So you see, there has been no mistake. Let that ring through your ears. So Shoghi Effendi, uh, asked Mason Rimi to come with him and study a future site for a separate shrine for Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha had once said that he wanted to be buried between the shrines of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. You know how when people had asked Abdul Baha, when can we celebrate your birthday? Because his birthday is on, um, on the date of the declaration of the Bab. He put the Day of the Covenant, as far in the calendar apart from it, six months on either end. So he wanted also to be buried halfway through, not halfway, between the shrines of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. On the sands of this crescent-shaped bay, when Shoghi Effendi arrived at a spot that the Guardian had envisioned, they walked about 400 meters on land, so almost a half kilometer, and they reached a spot that was halfway between the beach and railroad tracks. And he saw a 2.5 kilometer square property filled with trees and intersecting waterways and lakes. In the middle, Shoghi Effendi had the idea for this Taj Mahal-like structure. And he stated to Mason Remy that the final decision would rest with the Universal House of Justice. And it has. They have made a decision. So... As I promised, March to April 1922, the consultation in the Holy Land. It is difficult to underestimate how important this event is. Shoghi Effendi is going to invite many Baha'is among the foremost servants of Baha'u'llah in the world for consultations in the Holy Land. They're going to be under the impression that he wants to consult with them. But that's not exactly what's going to happen because after all, he is the guardian. They're going to be here mostly to heed his instructions. But before I do that, um, this is one of my favorite parts of the whole chronology. I love this man more than I have the words to express. This is Ali Azgar Razvini Mualim was his title the Guardian's postman. He was a remarkable man. He was very, very spiritual. He was deeply pious. He was very discreet and he was extremely hardworking. He was taught the faith by a wandering dervish and arrived in Haifa shortly after the ascension of Abdul Baha. When Shoghi Effendi was named the Guardian, Ali Asgar offered him his services and he would serve him for the rest of his life. And when he died in 1945, the way 
that Shoghi Effendi buried him, the esteem he showed him, the honors he bestowed upon him, I can guarantee you we will all be in tears. For 25 years, Ali Asghar was at Shoghi Effendi's side. He was loyal. He was understanding. He was ready to render any service, no matter how small, to his beloved guardian. He became known as Mualim, which means teacher. And he had many duties. He taught Baha'i children written and spoken Persian. He taught them the Baha'i teachings. He served tea to the guardian's guests. He brought cakes for feast days, but his most important and confidential duty by far was postman for the guardian. Under the beating sun, under the pouring rain, every day for 25 years, Ali Asghar carried the heavy briefcase of mail back and forth to the post office. This was by far the most confidential position of anyone surrounding the beloved guardian. And he was the perfect man for the job. Shohi Effendi trusted him so completely that he was the envy of everyone. March 1922, Shohi Effendi calls Baha'is the, to the Holy Land for consultation. Okay. According to Ruhiya Hanum, there was very little doubt in her mind that on reading Abdul Baha's will and testament, Shoghi Effendi's very first thought was the election of the Universal House of Justice as soon as as possible. In one of his earliest communications to the Baha'is in Persia in the, on the 16th of January, the Guardian refers to the Universal House of Justice, saying that he would later announce the preliminary steps for its election. So one of the young Guardian's earliest acts in March 1922 was to summon prominent, devoted, and deepened Baha'is to Haifa, to discuss this matter with him. So you see here the ones that I have photos for, but I'm gonna give you the list. From England, the Guardian called Lady Blumfield, Ethel Rosenberg, and Major Tudor Pole. From America, he summoned Emma Jean Hogue, Roy Wilhelm, Mountford Mills, and Mason Remy. The Guardian called Laura and Hippolyte Dreyfus Barnet from France, Consul and Alice Schwartz from Germany, and he also summoned two well-known Persian Baha'is, Avari and Fazel, but they were not able to attend. Remember the name Avari. That man is a piece of work, and he's going to make the Guardian suffer for years. Three Baha'is arrived late, Sigid Mustafa Rumi from Burma, Corinne True and her daughter Catherine True from the United States. There were two major forces at work in the early months of the Guardian's ministry, according to Ruhiya Hanum. One force was this irrepressible, youthful eagerness of the Guardian to implement all of the instructions of his beloved grandfather clearly set forth in the Will and Testament, including the election of the Universal House of Justice. Now, the other countervailing force at work in the early moments of the Guardian's ministry was the protection bestowed on the Guardian by the will and testament of Abdu'l-Baha. The Guardian wanted to do these things. He had this eagerness. But on the other hand, he was also protected by this will and testament that offered him, that bestowed on him infallibility in all matters related to the cause. So as Shoghi Effendi was, was attempting to set in motion the preliminaries of the election, of the planning of the Universal House of Justice, the hand of divine guidance, the protection of the will and testament, looking over him, protecting him, guiding him, inspiring him, pointing him in the right direction, showed him this was premature. Why? Let's look at the consultations with the Baha'i group.
during the consultations with these 11 eminent, stalwart, devoted, dedicated, enkindled Baha'is from around the world, it became apparent to the Guardian very, very clearly that no matter how much he wanted personally himself and his own youthful eagerness to elect the Universal House of Justice, it was an extremely dangerous step to take in 1922. Why? The necessary firm foundation of Baha'u'llah's administrative order did not exist. Shoghi Effendi did not have a sufficient reservoir of qualified, deepened, well-informed, firm Baha'is to draw on. In his infallibility and his familiarity with Shoh Abdul Baha's leadership and the Baha'i holy text, Shoghi Effendi alone realized, well, the Universal House of Justice is like the roof and you really can't build a roof unless you have walls. And the walls and the foundation were local assemblies and national assemblies. And so the Guardian pivoted and realized that the task that was the most urgent was to raise up the administrative order. <sighs> The issue with these consultations was that these believers mistakenly thought that Shoghi Effendi had called them for consultation to the Holy Land, for their opinion, for their wisdom. They uh, all unanimously thought it was time to elect the Universal House of Justice. So the process of these consultations was basically Shoghi Effendi getting them to understand that his infallibly guided instinct of building up the administrative order was the way to go. They had really underestimated the Guardian. And the way that Shoghi Effendi navigated this very kind of treacherous and, and uh, delicate, delicate situation, because all of them were older than him, he was the youngest by probably 20 years, um, in which he had no one on his side except for the greatest holy leaf, except, is, is really interesting because he behaved like a general at war, like a brilliant general at war that never got distracted by details or emergencies. He would never lose sight of the forest for the trees. So the Guardian's ultimate decision to build Baha'u'llah's administrative order before electing the Universal House of Justice. And I chose this picture of the building of the Universal House of Justice to illustrate the building of the administrative order. Shoghi Effendi, of course, 100% won over all of the distinguished Baha'is to his side. After the consultations, after he had explained things to them, they finally understood, yes, the Guardian, of course, is right. It is time to establish functioning and mature local and spiritual assemblies. And two months, this is two months after he became the guardian, he was already setting up the structure for the world administrative order. So in March, April, 1922, Shoghi Effendi does something very interesting. He's going to appoint a nine member assembly in the Holy Land. And he's going to appoint his great aunt, Abdul Baha's sister, Baha'u'llah's daughter, Bahie Hanum, also known as the greatest holy leaf, as his representative. And this decision, along with copies of letters from Bahie Hanum and Shoghi Effendi to that effect, were published in Star of the West. So that the greatest holy leaf would have the authority to manage things in the Holy Land legally in Shoghi Effendi's absence. March, April, 1922, the growth of the Baha'i World Center. So exactly like Abdul Baha in 1892, in 1922, his first year, his first months as guardian, Shoghi Effendi be begins work on every avenue that has that that is part of his part of his aims, including the growth of the Baha'i World Center. 
work has already begun on the Western Pilgrim House. The electrification that Abdul Baha began is ongoing with Curtis Kelsey in the Holy Land. Um, the shrines of the Bab will be illuminated soon. I'll tell you that story. And before leaving for Europe in March of 1922, Shoghi Effendi discussed with Mason Rimi the future Mashrikul Asghar, the future temple on the Holy Land. So he is already beginning work on several fronts. I'm going to go back. Oh, sorry. April 1922, the illumination of the shrines. This is extremely important. This is a this is an, a story that's important symbolically because electricity was very rare at the time and the shrines will be illumined by electric generators. And the illumination of the shrines is almost like a culmination of prophecy. It's these shrines bathed in light in the darkest night, electricity providing light where there should be no light. And the shrines are beautified, they're visible, you know? So it's, it's, it's an important uh, accomplishment because this is something that was started by Shoghi Effendi. And I'm gonna tell you real quick, uh, Curtis Kelsey and Abdul Baha. Now, those of you who've been with me for my four chronologies, you know that I like to put donkey pictures as often as I possibly can. I had other options for Curtis Kelsey than the one with him on the donkey, but I made an executive decision to choose this one because donkeys are amazing. This is a picture of Curtis Kelsey astride a donkey in 1921. Curtis Kelsey is the kind of person that Abdul Baha loved. He's a very simple man. He was not very educated. Uh, and he bounced around in his childhood. He went to a military academy, blah, blah, blah. He became a Baha'i in 1917. And he was on the LSA, the local spiritual assembly of New York with Roy Wilhelm. And Roy Wilhelm recommended to Abdul Baha to bring in Curtis Kelsey to install the three electric generators that he had donated. So that happened in the last year of Abdul Baha's life. And Abdul Baha's last few months, he would refuse to eat lunch at home with his family. He would go to the pilgrim house and a bond of camaraderie developed between Abdul Baha the very, very small Japanese diamond that we know as Saichiro Fujita and the very, very, very tall and lanky American Curtis Kelsey. The trio would have lunch every single day from three completely different cultures and they treasured their time together. Fujita had a little brown cat and right before Abdul Baha arrived, Fujita would lock the cat in the kitchen and then Abdul Baha would come in with his sweeping robes and he would say, let the cat out. And Fujita would open the door and the cat would run to Abdul Baha to be pet and to be fed. And they all three enjoyed this routine equally. And Fujita and Curtis Kelsey were just amazed that Abdul Baha had as much fun as them. And the daughters of Abdul Baha were always like, no, come back to the house and rest and eat. And Abdul Baha would always say, I like to eat with my friends. So Curtis Kelsey was in the Holy Land when Abdul Baha passed away and he stayed in the Holy Land. And shortly after the 5th of April, 1922, Shoghi Effendi thanked Curtis Kelsey. Now this is Curtis Kelsey here. He's very tall. He is at the shrine of Baha'u'llah during his first pilgrimage. This is a photograph that I was given by the United States National Baha'i Archive. And I thank them from the bottom of my heart. It's it's such a beautiful quality picture. Um, a few days before the 5th of April, 1922, which is the date when Shoghi Effendi leaves for Switzerland for the first time ever. 5th of April, 1922. So a few days before that, Shoghi Effendi saw Curtis Kelsey and asked him to join him on a walk. Um, Curtis Kelsey had read the will and testament backwards and forwards, and he knew everything about the station of the guardian. He knew that he was protected by Abdul Baha himself. He knew that um, this was not going to be a run of the mill walk because he was going to be walking with the guardian. So as Shoghi Effendi and Curtis Kelsey made, made their way up Mount Carmel, 
children were playing around and they were joyfully dancing and dancing in and out of the shadows of the street. And these were the early days of electricity. And, and it was an exciting new development for, for residents of Haifa, these street lamps. And so the kids were playing with the shadows. And Shoghi Effendi turned to Curtis and thanked him for the wonderful work he'd done in installing the three generators. And he assured him that Abdu'l-Baha himself appreciated his strenuous efforts. Uh, Curtis was very, very uncomfortable. And so he he does what most of us do, including me. He batted away the compliment and said, well, Shoghi Effendi, I was very happy doing the work for the master and I want no credit. Listen to this. The guardian stopped walking. He looked into Curtis's eyes and firmly reiterated, nevertheless, appreciation goes with your service. So the illumination of the shrines, the, I love this picture, oh my God. You know, one of the websites I love the most is the website Baha'i Historical Facts. They, <laughs> Baha'i Relics, Baha'i Historical Facts, there's so much available online to illustrate. I was just, just love this. This is the generator. It's a picture of the actual generator. In early April, before Shoghi Effendi traveled to Switzerland for eight months to recover from the shock he had just received of becoming the guardian of the cause of Baha'u'llah, Shoghi Effendi gave instructions to Curtis Kelsey for illuminating the shrines. This was Abdu'l-Baha's long cherished desire to bathe the shrine of the Bab in light and Shoghi Effendi with the help of Curtis Kelsey was going to fulfill it. Now, as I said before, there is a depth of significance to the illumination of the shrines that cannot be ignored. As you know, during his imprisonment in Maku, the Bab had been deprived of even a lamp. He was in total darkness. And now he was bathed in light with the Mediterranean sun during the day and electricity at night. It was a symbol of the irrepressible victory of the faith. You tried to put our Bob in darkness and now we bathe him in light. Sort of like that, in a sense. And this is actually a photograph of the shrines being illuminated for the first time. See? You can see the light at the top and the light going down the few terraces. So it was really beautiful. So on the first day of Rizvan, 21st of April, 1922, two weeks after the Guardian had left for Switzerland, the Shrine of the Bab and the Shrine of Baha'u'llah were illuminated for the first time. At Bahji, the Shrine of Baha'u'llah's illumination was, was flooded with light, was so bright that it was visible from the Shrine of the Bab. But guess what? The illumination of the Shrine of the Bab in Haifa was so bright that it temporarily confused a ship captain steering in his ship that night. And there was an incident. And so because of that incident, the port authorities added the lights on the Shrine of the Bab to the official navigation chart. This uh, is really one of the most important stories also in this chronology because late April, 1922, Curtis Kelsey experiences the greatest holy leafs um, commanding presence, commanding presence. And I like this photo because she looks commanding in this photograph and we have a we have a very bad um sort of image of the greatest holy leaf we think of her as saintly quiet with her arms folded gentle you know but she was a commanding presence and this is a little story to show you even at 76 years old how powerful this woman was because she was in charge of the faith for over eight years. If you count all the absences of Abdu'l-Baha and Shoghi Effendi and you count them together, she was left at the helm for eight years. And this is not something a meek and weak person can do. No, she was a general. She may have been gentle, 
But that does not mean that she was not very commanding and powerful in her own right. So when uh, Curtis Kelsey was about to leave, uh, he was brought to, uh, to to the greatest holy leaf and um, he was broke. He had he had no money. He, he he could get as far as Istanbul. That's that's all he had. So when he was brought to the greatest holy leaf, she asked him. She she wanted to she wanted to, she praised him for his stellar work, and he and she insisted that he take money to return to the United States because of course the greatest holy leaf knew the man is broke. So he responded, "No, all my affairs are in order." He had absolutely no intention of taking money from Abdul Baha's family. Greatest Holy Leaf reached out, took Curtis's hand and said firmly, Kelsey, you need this money to pay for your return home. And she placed the money in his hand and Curtis only accepted it on one condition. I will take it if you let me return it after getting home. The Greatest Holy Leaf very firmly responded with a single word, no spoken with such authority, Curtis Kelsey could sense that the greatest holy leaf had issued a divine command. And he, in that moment, she reminded him so much of her brother, Abdul Baha. He had known Abdul Baha, remember? He had spent so much time with him. And she just reminded him of him. And Shoghi Effendi would always say, the greatest holy leaf to him was the feminine incarnation of Abdul Baha. So we have to adjust how we think of the daughter of Baha'u'llah. We have to adjust our sights. So this is a little bit out of order, but I had to tell you the stories that were happening in the Holy Land in a row. And now I'm going to make a little parenthesis and uh, talk about the eight months of Shoghi Effendi in Switzerland. 5 April to 15 December, eight months. Shoghi Effendi in Switzerland. From these eight months, Shoghi Effendi is crushed by grief and his new responsibilities. By early April 1922, Shoghi Effendi was in modern parlance, emotionally, physically, spiritually, burnt out. There is no other word. He was crushed by the weight of his sorrows, by the weight of his grief, by not having been able to say goodbye to Abdul Baha in person one last time, by the realization of his station as the guardian. And I want to explain something very important right now. Why Switzerland? Shoghi Effendi had to go physically, geographically, at far from the world center to stop feeling the pull of his responsibilities. This is my interpretation. He could never, ever, ever rest in, 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 in the Holy Land. And this is something that I gleaned from very carefully reading The Priceless Pearl. From Ruhi Hanum's words, I understood there is no way that the guardian could ever rest in the Holy Land because his work was there. So the distance is one. And from having meditated and thought about this for many, many hours, weeks, months even, why Switzerland? I think because of the mountains. They give perspective. You climb them, you can see vistas. You know, you climb them, you, you conquer them. You climb them, you conquer yourself. You know, the mountains and the distance. And the beauty, Interlaken is, in, is a lake in between, it's two lakes in between mountains. I mean, it's so beautiful. You're going to be just, you're going to love all these pictures of Switzerland I have for you. Um, many years after this, Shoghi Effendi would speak about his first trip to Switzerland to Leroy, Iowa. I didn't want to be the guardian of the cause. In the first place, I didn't think I was worthy. Next place, I didn't want to face these responsibilities. 
I didn't want to be a guardian. I knew what it meant. I knew that my life as a human being was over. I knew that my life as a human being was over. I didn't want it and I didn't want to face it. Shoghi Effendi wrote a letter to the Baha'i world regarding his absence, where he basically says that he has to leave because he can no longer work. I will leave you the pleasure of discovering this on the website. This is a photograph of Shoghi Effendi in Switzerland, looking over a low wall down to a glacier. So what first happened when Shoghi Effendi left the World Center was he traveled to Germany to consult doctors, and the doctors found something deeply alarming. Shoghi Effendi had no reflexes left. After Germany, Shoghi Effendi spent time in Switzerland and the Bernese Oberland, which became his second home. Shoghi Effendi loved the alluring mountains, loved his host, a, a Swiss German named Mr. Hauser, an old Swiss mountain guide in the town of Interlaken. He would remain close to Mr. Hauser for years, spending many summers in his cabin. Shoghi Effendi, exactly like Abdul Baha, Baha'u'llah, and the Bab, loved good, humble, simple people. And he had a very close relationship with Mr. Hauser and wrote to him regularly. They exchanged postcards. They exchanged photographs. It was a, it was a real friendship. But remember, Mr. Hauser was not a Baha'i. So for years, Shoghi Effendi rented Mr. Hauser's tiny, tiny, tiny attic. And he paid one franc per night. The ceiling was so low that any guests coming to visit him had to hunch over. And Shoghi Effendi only had a small bed and a pitcher of cold water so that he could bathe. From Interlaken, uh, Shoghi Effendi would hike the Bernese Oberland for 16 hours on end, sometimes hiking 40 kilometers a day. And he found healing in these exertions in the wilderness and the fresh mountain air. Shoghi Effendi commemorated the anniversary of the one year of the passing of Abdul Baha alone in Switzerland. Years later, when speaking to Leroy Iowas, Shoghi Effendi told him his reason for leaving the Holy Land. The position entrusted to him by Abdul Baha and his will was so overwhelming to him at the time, he felt like he did not want to be the guardian and did not want to face his responsibility. And he told Leroy, until I conquered myself. The greatest holy leaf in the holy land. So between the 21st of April, 1922, and the 27th of May, 1924, Bahia Hanum, the greatest holy leaf, is going to write letters for 48 months to the Baha'is of the world in support of Shoghi Effendi. She wrote letters to individuals. She wrote letters to communities. She wrote letters to assemblies. And I'm going to let you go to the website for all of this because I have a lot more to cover and I am not going fast enough, given my allotted time. So these are the 49 ways in which the holy, greatest holy leaf speaks about uh, Shoghi Effendi. A most great favor, a wondrous gift, an incomparable cure, the chosen branch, his eminence, no gift could equal this, the appointed center. There's 49 that I was able to count in her letters. Now, this is a letter written by, by the greatest holy leaf. Um, it is... It's not one of the letters I talk about. I just wanted to show you her handwriting in Persian. And I have 21 letters that she wrote 
And I'm just going to read you one excerpt. Give me one minute to choose a to choose the one I love the most. Okay, so for example, she wrote for 48 months, she wrote letters like this to Baha'is of the East and the West. We are more than thankful to God that he has not left us without a leader, but that Shoghi Effendi is appointed to guide the administration of the cause. We hope that the friends of God, the beloved and the handmaids of the merciful will pray for us that we may be enabled to help Shoghi Effendi in every way in our power to accomplish the mission entrusted to him. For 48 months, the 76-year-old to 80-year-old Bahi Hanum, the daughter of Baha'u'llah, wrote letters like this to every conceivable community. Look how many excerpts I have for you to read on the website. See that? So um, this is the first election of the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States uh, between the 22nd and the 26th of April, 1922. So it's an important event, but Shoghi Effendi does not count this as the first National Spiritual Assembly of the United States. The first National Spiritual Assembly of the United States, according to Shoghi Effendi, properly and duly elected is 1925, because for an assembly to be counted as a, really a proper Baha'i National Spiritual Assembly, the uh, the election had to be a, had to follow a certain process, and the way it was elected in 1922, although it was the first time, was not really done um, according to proper uh, prerogatives. So I want to just talk very quickly about the state of the worldwide Baha'i administrative order in 1922, the first few months where Shoghi Effendi becomes the guardian. Uh, most Baha'i communities in the world in 1922 had national and local customs that weren't compatible with the faith. In Persia, there was an overlap with Muslim culture. Monogamy wasn't really very well understood. Baha'is in Persia still used opium and drank alcohol, something that Western Baha'is also did. In America, Baha'is were really attached to their churches and they had membership in secret societies like the Rosicrucian Society and other secret societies. So what the Guardian did to address these issues throughout his entire ministry is a twofold approach. First, Shoghi Effendi created a universal, consistent, and coherent method of carrying on Baha'i community life and organizing its affairs, based firmly in the teachings of Baha'u'llah and the master's elaborations. The second thing that Shoghi Effendi did throughout his ministry to unify Baha'i life and create Baha'i communities as we know them now was to patiently educate the Baha'is with 38,000 letters and to help them understand the objectives and the implications of religion, the truths enshrined in them. And this is where we're going to start to see all the famous letters of Shoghi Effendi, the World Order of Baha'u'llah, the Golden Age of the Cause of Baha'u'llah, the Advent of Divine Justice, the Promised Day has come. All of those things are coming up. December 1922, Shoghi Effendi returns to Haifa. The greatest holy leaf, after eight months of absence, needed Shoghi Effendi back in Haifa because the faith needed its guardian. So one night, probably sometime in early to mid-December 1922, Shoghi Effendi was coming back from one of his all day hikes and he's just absolutely stunned to see his mother and a relative on a street in Interlaken. Stunned. They had been sent by the greatest holy leaf. It was time to go home. Shogi Effendi returns to Haifa on the 15th of December, 1922. And he says, I have now returned to the Holy Land with renewed vigor and refreshed spirit. 
Refreshed and reassured, I resumed my arduous duties. It was such a needed retirement. I have feelings of joyful confidence. Our guardian is back. See, there's a lot more. So again, please visit the chronology, people. I am abbreviating here. Um, this is important, so I will I will say this. The Guardian told uh, Leroy Iowis many, many years later that um, he turned himself to God when he was in Switzerland. He said, I fought with myself until I conquered myself. Then I came back and I turned myself over to God and I was the guardian. He comes back, the guardian. And December 1922, he is flooded with correspondence. These are all random telegrams I found on the internet from the 1920s, just to show you piles and piles of mail. Um, Shogi Effendi was answering personal letters, individual letters. He was... Uh, he was saying important things in these letters and the national spiritual assemblies began grumbling a little bit because they said, Oh my gosh, the individuals in their country are receiving very important guidance from the guardian. And we don't know, you know, so this is the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the correspondence, how Shogi Fendi has to deal with the correspondence. So he has to deal with individual questions where there's going to be very important guidance that's going to be conveyed. He's also going to write to national spiritual assemblies. He's going to write to committees, but this sort of the piles of mail after he returns from uh, Interlaken in Switzerland, this is going to be a major feature in his life for the next 36 years. Another major feature of his life for the next 36 years is Shogi Effendi's regular meeting with pilgrims. It was customary for Shogi Effendi to, uh, from the beginning of his guardianship, meet with pilgrims. This is Shogi Effendi here. This is uh, Fujita. Um, there's also some Western Baha'is here. Uh, and he would visit the shrines of the Bab with the Eastern pilgrims and the shrine of Abdul Baha. And they would all refresh themselves with a cup of tea at the Eastern pilgrims house right next to the shrine of the Bab. This is a habit the guardian is going to keep for um, the rest of his life. And now a bit of good news. You remember on the 30th of January, 1922, the Covenant Breakers had seized the keys of the Shrine of Baha'u'llah. And so for a year, nobody was able to set foot in the shrine. On the 8th of February, the keys of the Shrine of Baha'u'llah are returned to Shogi Effendi. This is really a great victory. Um, and And when he received the letter, he took immediate steps to obtain the keys and they would never, ever leave the hands of the faith ever again. So I hope you remember that I told you to remember the name of this guy. 1922, 1923, Avari, the covenant breaker. We are going to begin now today, this first section on covenant breakers and I've made them as informative, but as short as possible, because I refuse to give too much space to covenant breakers in my chronologies. Um, oftentimes they will be represented by reptiles just because I can and because I wanted to. Um, this is the story of Avari in the Holy Land. So from the moment he became a Baha'i, um, he was very successful in teaching and he was very, very arrogant. And so, um, he never made it to the consultations in the Holy Land, to which he had been invited by the Guardian. And uh, he thought he was a shoe-in for membership in the Universal House of Justice. So he was very much upset when he found out that the decision had been made to develop the administrative order because he wanted to be on the House of Justice. So the Guardian explained things to him, but he refused the Guardian's explanations and he just became obsessed with the idea. 
And he had absolutely no faith in Shoghi Effendi. He had no respect for Shoghi Effendi. He saw him as an inexperienced young man of 24 years old. And he was a fully grown man, an erudite, successful teacher. He was 52. He was in full possession of his powers. He was knowledgeable. So anyway, this is how he saw things. So when he was in Haifa, he was treated considerately. But after a brief Haifa, Shoghi Effendi told Avery, please go to England. So he went to England, which we're going to look at in a little bit. Now we're going to just focus on Shoghi Effendi's covenant-breaking worries. From the very beginning of his guardianship, Shoghi Effendi was burdened with all sorts of impossible problems. And what weighed on him the most were the machinations and the plotting of the covenant breakers all over the world. Because they were not just in Haifa, they were in America, they were in England, they were in Egypt, they were in Syria, they were in Turkey, they were in Persia, they were in Iraq, they were in Haifa. So all over the world, you have these people who are actively working against the Guardian. Um, he, Shoghi Effendi wrote clear warnings to people who would soon become covenant breakers. And of course, those warnings, because of their inflated ego and their soul-devouring jealousy, were never heeded. That is the very definition of a covenant breaker. They don't listen when you talk to them and they're devoured by jealousy. Um, Hussein Afnan was the grandson of Baha'u'llah. And he had three brothers who were also grandsons of Baha'u'llah and who all married the three granddaughters of Abdul Baha. Two of these were Shoghi Effendi's own sisters, and every last one of them would become covenant breakers. Shoghi Effendi's youth is definitely a test for people because it was actually an illusion. He was the guardian. Doesn't matter if he was 24 or 48 or 60. He was the guardian. So he was dealing with the biggest test of his ministry, the test that would remain the biggest test of his ministry for the next 36 years, because covenant breaking has an accompanying toxicity and poisonous filth. And he dealt with it like a steely-eyed, clear-sighted, intransigent general. Never had any hesitations. He would write to the entire Baha'i world and say, register all male, inform friends. So Avari was sent to England. This is Avari, the snake in England. So he arrived there in January 1923, and the Guardian had asked him to help the believers deepen their knowledge in the faith. Um, Guardian made sure that they would treat Avari well. I mean, the guy is an egomaniac. He's like self-centered. He's like, he has an ego the size of an immense ego. So just placate him, treat him nice, treat him with respect. But the English believers went overboard. They treated him with so much reverence and they were so hospitable to him and they praised him so excessively. They wrote gushing letters about him to Star of the West. And so he began speaking three, four times a week. Uh, he gave series of lectures on Tahere. And so his success in London just bolstered his egotism. And, and so he became began writing manipulative in sense, insincere letters couched in beautiful language. He was a very talented writer. So the unfortunate thing with Avery is that he's extremely talented and extremely deepened, which makes him supremely dangerous as a covenant breaker. Um, and in 1923, he wrote a letter as an individual Baha'i to the National Convention of the United States and Canada. I mean, imagine the ego for a person to write to a convention. And he just began thinking that he could lead the faith much better than Shoghi Effendi. He was the better choice. He was the better leader. And so he started undermining the position of Shoghi Effendi. And after a short stay in London, he traveled to Egypt. And it's really in Egypt that he's going to begin his covenant breaking activities. Like London was kind of just a warm up for him. He's just getting started. Um, so he arrived in the spring of 1923 to Egypt 
And he published a book, a two volume history that he wrote uh, 10 years before. Uh, and he was hoping to earn a ton of money with this book. And of course that never happens. I mean, who makes money from selling books? You know, I mean, even back then that wasn't even possible. So Avari stayed in Cairo for several months and pitted the local spiritual assembly of Cairo against the community. He started dividing the community. He was in Cairo for months. He caused so much dissension, disunity, and strife among the community that the local spiritual assembly wrote to Shoghi Effendi. Shoghi Effendi tried and failed to uh, put a stop to the division and the disunity because Avari did everything he could to prevent a reconciliation between the assembly and the believers. So soon after this, uh, Shoghi Effendi could endure the pain no longer, and so he left the Holy Land for Switzerland. At the moment Avari left Cairo, all of the misunderstandings in the Cairo community between the local spiritual assembly and the Baha'is disappeared. March, April 1923, the Baha'i Fund raising assemblies and Abdul Baha's nine terraces. So, on the 12th of March, the Guardian establishes the Baha'i Fund. So we have a date for when the Baha'i Fund came into existence. And Shoghi Effendi uh, gave three spiritual principles on the Baha'i Fund. The first spiritual principle of Baha'i contributions is that they are a privilege for Baha'is only. They are a Baha'i privilege. We do not take money from people who do not believe in Baha'u'llah and who are not members of the Baha'i community. The second spiritual principle is that they must absolutely be voluntary. No one can be coerced. We cannot beg people to give. It has to come from the heart. And there are two more spiritual principles. One of them is a very beautiful principle. It's this principle of sacrifice. It's a very... All three principles are really internal and it's your own personal relationship with the fund. But there is a fourth principle that Shoghi Effendi, um, Shoghi Effendi uh, mentions. And it's that individuals are free to earmark contributions. Earmarking meaning I want my money to go for uh, the International Baha'i Fund, or I want my money to go for the building of the uh, uh, shrine of Abdul Baha in the Holy Land. So you're, allow you're allowed to earmark. Then in 1923, uh, the Guardian begins promoting unity in assemblies. Um, I'll give you an example. The Guardian was infinitely patient. Um, so the Guardian would like train the assemblies to be more united. And one uh, one assembly uh, just it was a, it was a, it was a very infant institution. It was a new assembly, it was a new local assemblies. And they voted off one of the members of the assembly. They didn't like the guy. So they just voted him off the assembly. So Shoghi Effendi cabled them immediately and said, this action could have worldwide repercussions and inflict irreparable injury to the cause of Baha'u'llah. So you have a very concrete way in which Shoghi Effendi nursed these local institutions from their infancy. 1923 to 1929, the nine terraces of Abdul Baha. So the nine terraces of Abdul Baha would go from the bottom here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Um, that was the vision of Abdul Baha. And because his grandfather's vision was so precise, Shoghi Effendi began working immediately in, uh, in integrating them as part of an integral part of the shrine. Uh, beginning in 1923, there was only one partial terrace. Uh, around the shrine, Shoghi Effendi had a single-minded goal to build these nine terraces. By 1925, the greatest holy leaf uh, gave a part of her inheritance to Shoghi Effendi, and Shoghi Effendi began carving out terraces on the shrine of the Bab. And this would continue on for uh, six years, and so we'll be revisiting the terraces of Abdul Baha later on. Um, these green section, these blue sections are always about holy places. 
and the green sections are always about teaching and pioneering. And 1923, Shogi Effendi's joy at Hyde and Clara Dunn's effort in, in Australia. And of course, Hyde and Clara Dunn are the mother and father of the Australian Baha'i community. They traveled a lot to New Zealand as well. And this is Father Dunn and Mother Dunn. Uh, Hyde Dunn and Clara Dunn. Nothing made, see, comparatively to nothing made the Guardian more unhappy than covenant breaking. The, the 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 counterbalance to that is that nothing made the Guardian happier than Baha'i's success in the teaching and pioneering field. Um, so he would write to faraway Australia hearing about their success and he would tell Hyde and Clara Dunn, what an encouragement and what an inspiration to be revived every now and then with a fresh breeze wafting from faraway Australia and laden with a perfume of your love and devotion to his sacred cause. Uh, just nothing made the Guardian happier. So this is a very big deal, my friends. 29th of April, 1923, February, 1924, May and Mary Maxwell's Pilgrimage Part 1. This is the SS Paris, the very ship on which May and Mary Maxwell sailed from New York, crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, May was on the verge of death. She had been May Bowles first, and she had been one of the very first Western pilgrims to visit Abdul Baha in 1898. And she was very attached to Abdul Baha, and Abdul Baha's death nearly killed her. And so her husband, probably the best husband in the history of the world, thought the only thing that's going to revive her is to go to the Holy Land and spend time with Shoghi Effendi. So he sent his wife, who was like very weak from the shock of Abdul Baha's death, to Shoghi Effendi with his 12-year-old daughter. And this is the story of Mary Maxwell meets Shoghi Effendi for the first time. On purpose, I chose a photograph of her on a horse because I like horses too. <laughs> horses and donkeys. This is the rule of this chronology. <laughs> Um, she was fully grown by the age of 12. So she was the same height as she would be when she would later marry the guardian. She is actually in front of the Western Baha'i Pilgrim House in 1923 during her pilgrimage. So this is a very funny story. Mary Maxwell, Shoghi Effendi's future wife, was 12 years old in 1923 and it was her first pilgrimage. And the first time she ever met Shoghi Effendi was very, very embarrassing for her. May Maxwell, her mother, as you know, was very poorly from the shock of Abdul Baha's death, and she was resting in her room, recovering from the trip as well. Her nights were mostly sleepless, and she had suffered insomnia on the whole trip long. And so Mary had learned from a young age to protect her mother, who was very um, had very poor health. And at any cost, she would protect her from any intrusion. So Mary, 12-year-old Mary, was in the hallway of the pilgrim house when the door suddenly opened and a young man, a young Persian man, stepped in with a deft, elegant movement. And he asked if he could see Mrs. Maxwell. Mary was only 12, but she was already fully grown. So she pulled herself up to her full height looked at the young Persian man squarely in the eyes and said with considerable dignity and a lot of self-assurance, Mrs. Maxwell is resting. Who is it wants to see her? The young man replied, I am Shoghi Effendi. Mary gasped. She turned around, she ran straight into her mother's room. She jumped in the bed, she stuck her head under pillows like a puppy and she woke her mother up and her mother asked, what on earth is going on? She was like, hey, 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 he's here, he's here, he's here, he's here. So finally her mother managed to understand that Shogi Effendi was there. So she ordered Mary, now Mary, pull yourself together go tell him I am coming. That's the first time Mary Maxwell and Shoghi Effendi ever met. Mary Maxwell's car ride. Mary Maxwell was an irrepressible spirit. So Shoghi Effendi 
and Mary and May Maxwell and other pilgrims were in this Cunningham car, seven seater car. And Mary Maxwell was sitting on the edge of the folded back top here. She was sitting on the edge of the folded back top. And she was just enjoying the wind in her hair. And Shogi Effendi was protesting her recklessness and warned her not to fall out. And Ruhia Hanum, as an adult, would recall her state of mind. And she would say, I was too intoxicated with the morning and all the bounties showered upon me to be afraid. And as the car was driving on the beach, there were hundreds of little crabs that fled before the car. And, and Shogi Effendi began to tell Mary Maxwell how much he longed to see the Rocky Mountains in Canada and his love of mountains and mountaineering. And he always followed Shogi Effendi until the end of his life, always followed with the greatest interest any attempt made to conquer Mount Everest. And Sutherland Maxwell, William Sutherland Maxwell made the right decision in sending um, his wife to Shogi Effendi because Shogi Effendi's care for May Maxwell was above and beyond. Uh, it was incredibly kind. Uh, Shogi Effendi was the only one who could help her. And she arrived on pilgrimage in a state of depression, ill health, insomnia, and emotional turmoil. Day after day, the guardian helped her as she struggled with her insurmountable guilt. He helped her, comforted her. He lifted her spirits. He filled her heart with hope. Um, he knew she was spiritually ill, not just physically ill. So he told May Maxwell that her depression was the result of a serious illness and that when she was physically weak, she was more prone to spiritual weakness as well. Shogi Effendi acted during her pilgrimage kind of like her spiritual physician. Uh, but even the guardian knew that only the faith would really make uh, May Maxwell recover, and he counseled her to throw herself into service. Um, this is a seed catalog from 1923, and I put this picture because Shogi Effendi is going to become passionate about seeds, grass seeds, flower seeds, grass seeds especially, are going to be a big deal for him. He's going to spend 20 years trying to find the perfect grasses for the gardens. And he would be reading these, 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 uh, these catalogs, you know, constantly. He, was, he would always get these catalogs and he would order from France and from England. Um, so he was looking for the perfect grass to install lawns on the Shrine of the Bob. And in May 1923, he cables an old Baha'i friend in Paris. And he says... What about our lawn project? The person didn't answer back. So 10 days later, Shogi Effendi wrote, he never, ever, ever, ever gave up. He wrote to the same person, letter still unanswered. What of lawn seeds? So this is happening during May Maxwell's, uh, May and Mary Maxwell's um, uh, pilgrimage. Uh, this is a story that's a very short story, but... Um, it's just to show you how much hers was Shogi Effendi for the Greatest Holy Leaf, how much he belonged to her. There was a meeting and the Greatest Holy Leaf was another room. And one of the Persian Baha'is was so overcome with emotion that he threw himself at Shogi Effendi and there was a commotion. And uh, the Greatest Holy Leaf was, her. it was like her heart got ripped out of her. She shrieked. She was like, did anyone hurt the guardian? You know, she couldn't just conceive it. She was constantly worried about Shogi Effendi. No matter how much her health declined, you know, the tragedy of Shogi Effendi is that he lost his grandfather when he became the guardian. Then he became the guardian and he was starting out his life as his aunt, his beloved grand aunt was ending her life. You know, she's 76 and he's 24. So they're going to be together for 11 years because she dies in 1923. But it's it's heartbreaking because she is his shield. And she protects him and she keeps all the covenant breakers in the family in line until she dies. And then after she dies, all hell breaks loose. Um. So in May 1923... It's time again for Shogi Effendi to go to, to uh, 
to Switzerland and he calls Mrs. Maxwell into his room and he tells her, um, Mrs. Maxwell, it is no use. I can't stand it. I'm going away. Um, couldn't do one more thing. Couldn't do one more step. Couldn't answer one more letter. Couldn't just, just needed to go back and, uh, um, go to Switzerland. And so from June to November, so a shorter amount of time this time, June, uh, July, August, September, October, November, five months instead of eight. This is Shogi Fendi's second summer retreat to Switzerland. And this is an absolutely gorgeous photograph from the Priceless Pearl of Shogi Fendi walking through a field of narcissists in Switzerland above Lake Geneva. Um, don't know when the photograph was taken, but early. So he was just, he describes in his letters the storm and stress that have agitated my life, ill health and physical exhaustion, bitter with feelings of anxiety and gloom. So he retires to Mr. Hauser's cabin again, and he rebuilds his strength again, and he goes on his 16-hour, 40-kilometer hikes again, and he makes a complete break with the work, and he receives no communications from the, the Holy Land. And these months are deeply meaningful, not just for the beauty of the scenery, but because he loves Mr. Hauser so much. And this, my friends, is this beloved Swiss mountain guide that Shogi Effendi loved so much that he put his arm around him with a genuine smile on his face, Mr. Hauser. And he would write Mr. Hauser letters like, Dear Mr. Hauser. I have just received your kind card and the mere view of Jungfrau with the admirably depicted town of Interlaken awoke in me the unforgettable memories of your friendliness, kindness, and hospitality during my delightful sojourn with you. These are moments of Shogi Effendi coming back to life bathing in this exceedingly beautiful nature in one of the most beautiful spots on earth with a man who is unfailingly kind and a life that is incredibly simple and these long arduous hikes where he conquers himself over and over and over again. So when he returns from oh, January to February 1924, May and Mary's Maxwell's Pilgrimage, part two. So, Autumn 1923, I am a little bit obsessed with Shogi Effendi's lawns, I will fully confess. Um, these are all pictures of lawns in the Holy Land that I got and I just collaged together. The French lawn seeds didn't work. So Shogi Effendi, when he returns to Haifa, he just embarks on a new lawn campaign, lawn and lawn seed campaign. Um, there's just very few grasses that would actually grow in the climate of Palestine. So, but Shogi Effendi wanted something and he would not back down. So he wrote to a cousin in Egypt, asked him to send him seeds from Egypt. Um, and <laughs> he was so delightful, Shogi Effendi, that when he was, he, he grew close to a lot of the people that he wrote to, all these horticultural dealers that were selling him seeds. He grew close to a lot of them. And uh, he assured a French collaborator of his most affectionate sentiments. Um, and eventually, he would find the right lawn seeds and he would grow beautiful lawns in the Holy Land. So on the 28th of November, 1923, the second anniversary of the passing of Abdul Baha, Shogi Effendi is in the Holy Land for the second anniversary. This is actually a photograph from the United States National Baha'i Archives of the funeral cortege of Shogi Effendi um, briefly pausing in front of uh, a building on the way to the Shrine of the Bab, 50 meters away from the Shrine of the Bab. And the commemoration deeply touched Shogi Effendi. So, but for the rest of Shogi Effendi's life, unfortunately, these commemorations of the passing of Abdul Baha would always um, just evoke tragic memories, you know? Uh, in the cables he dispatched to the world, he would always use words like poignant memories and grief and agony on the anniversary of the passing of Abdul Baha. This passing of Abdul Baha, not having been able to see him, this is a break 
for Shohi Effendi and he will never recover from it. Never, ever, ever, ever. So January to February 1924, May and Mary Maxwell's Pilgrimage to the Holy Land, part two. This is a photograph of May and Mary Maxwell in Ramleh, Egypt. When Shoghi Effendi left Haifa to go to Switzerland, they went to Egypt. And in Egypt, uh, Mary collected 10 pets. There were mammals, there were birds, there were reptiles. I mean, she was just an, this is just a, such an eager, unstoppable spirit. I think that Ruhia Hanum's eagerness for life is very well matched by Shoghi Effendi's eagerness. They were both very eager souls. And they were just so well-matched, so well-matched. Um, during their pilgrimage, they give a really interesting uh, <laughs> overview of Shoghi Effendi's schedule. So get ready. 5.30 a.m., Shoghi Effendi wakes up, prays, and meditates. Morning to afternoon, for several hours, Shoghi Effendi goes through his correspondence. Afternoon, Shoghi Effendi meets the Eastern pilgrims at the Shrine of the Bab, Afternoon to evening, appointments, building projects, manuscripts, correspondence. Evening, Shoghi Effendi has dinner with the Western pilgrims at the Western pilgrim house. And then late evening to probably midnight to one in the morning. After dinner, uh, more work in Shoghi Effendi's office. And this, my friends, you can multiply this by seven days a week, 12 months a year, 365 days, times 36 years. I did this one day when I was writing the chronology and I couldn't recover for three days. The Baha'i World, January, May, 1924. Okay, again, our least favorite person, Avare, is now in the Holy Land, but he's also going to go to Lebanon and Iraq because he is annoying and he travels. So he arrived in Haifa and he questioned the authenticity of the will and testament of Abdul Baha. So he's just like setting the tone for his arrival in the Holy Land. He questions the will and testament. So he sees the original copy in Abdul Baha's handwriting with the seals and the signatures. So he quiets down and he doesn't press the matter further. So, you know, he sees the will is authentic. You know, he, if Avari is a lot of things, he's not stupid. So he knows this is the original will. So he meets the greatest holy leaf and he pushes, pushes, pushes the universal house of justice. Then he sends letters all over Persia. Then he writes about his dissatisfaction with the guardian. He travels to Lebanon, does the same thing, creates fabrications in Beirut, spreading black gospel. Then he travels to Iraq, messes things up in Baghdad. And then he arrives in Persia. And in Persia, he begins actively opposing the Guardian. So in May 1924, the local spiritual assemblies start writing to the Guardian. What do we do with this guy? What are we going to do with him? Um, the greatest holy leaf writes long letters and a cable and that he's teeming with falsehood. And she praises the local spiritual assembly of Hamadan. Um, but he is still not expelled from the faith. Um, they're still trying to deal with uh, Avare, see if anything can be done. Horace Holly is the one, this is Horace Holly, he is the one who had the idea for the Baha'i world. And this is going to be a very, very important thing in Shoghi Effendi's life. Shoghi Effendi adored the Baha'i world. And this is all of the Baha'i world editions and the colors the Guardian personally chose for their covers for the entire 36-year ministry of the Guardian, ending in 1954. He chose that color. The that was the last color he chose. Um, he oversaw the whole publication. He chose the pictures. He mailed the manuscript. Uh, it was it, it was a love story. It was really a love story. The longest volume uh, between the volumes 1 to 12 that Shoghi Effendi produced was volume 8, covering the years 1938 to 1940, and it ran 1,039 pages. Now, by, by mid-March 1924, um, Shoghi Effendi, this is a forget-me-not. One, one of my favorite flowers, if not my favorite flower, but 
Keith Ransom Keller, before she died, she wrote a little poem uh, and she said that sacrifice is a seed that grows. And if her seed grew, she hoped it would be a modest forget-me-not. And if someone could pick one from the grave of uh, Qudus and bring it to Shoghi Effendi. And so that's why in her honor that I chose this forget-me-not for this story about the guardian talking about his heart. When the guardian was about to leave uh, Haifa again, he said to the greatest holy leaf and other members of the family and explained why he had to leave. He said, my heart is sensitive. I, just as I feel the ill feeling that exists between individuals and I'm injured by it, so too do I treasure the excellent qualities of the believers. Indeed, I hold these dearer than words can tell. After that most dread ordeal, the one and only solace of my heart was the loyalty, the staunchness, the love of the friends of the blessed beauty for Abdul Baha. We are almost finished for today. Um, there's just a couple of stories left. One is Shoghi Effendi in Switzerland. This is his third visit to Switzerland in 1924. This is Shoghi Effendi straddling an ice ridge on one of his climbs in the Swiss Alps. Um, and again, a long letter to Mr. Hauser, which I will let you discover on your own. Um, this is another photograph of Shoghi Effendi by a very steep glacier crevasse. He's very adventurous and he is unafraid. I mean, I would never stay that close to a glacier crevasse ever. It, look at Shoghi Effendi. He's just unafraid. Um, Shoghi Effendi only had one real hobby. If you want to guess, it was photography. Uh, he took a lot of extraordinary pictures in his first years, uh, and he wrote to a French photographer living in Switzerland, and he told him, I am impatiently waiting for the photographs which I sent you. I hope you received them. They are very, very dear to me. Please instantly reassure me by postcard on this subject. I hope they all came out well. Thinking of you in advance, I am yours devotedly, Shoghi Effendi. Um, this is just a picture of Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary, who succeeded... Uh, successfully completed the first ascent of Mount Everest at 11.30 a.m. on the 29th of May, 1953. So the Guardian followed the ascent of Mount Everest very closely for his whole life, and he was able to... Uh, 19... I, yeah, was he able? Forget. Sorry, I just lost my train of thought there for a moment. Um, the Guardian once described himself to Leroy Iowas as a mountaineer. He was really passionate about mountaineering, and he even uh, climbed mountains with hooks and and cables, like real mountaineering with with those uh, those shoes with the the cleats, you know, that you can stick in the ice. I mean, he did really um, real mountaineering. Uh, he was very athletic, you know, and you remember he was really good at tennis too when he was in in, in the college. So he's a very athletic person. And you have to also remember that Shog uh, Abdul Baha was also extremely athletic. So July to December 1924, Dr. Eslamont becomes Shoghi Effendi's secretary. We're going to end on a very good note today. In On the 18th of July 1924, a vice consul Imbri, this man here, who is also shown here in this picture, was uh, beaten and killed by a mob in Iran. Um, it, there was this anti-Baha'i sentiment in Iran at the time in 1924, and the population was very fanatic. And uh, they uh, they cut to pieces this man because uh, he had he had he was not a Baha'i. He had just gone to visit a fountain uh, that had been made famous by a Baha'i who had. Uh, been struck blind and found his vision again. So he went to visit this fountain that was distantly associated with the faith and he was hacked to pieces by a mob. And the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States and Canada sent roses for his funeral um, in the names of the Baha'is of Persia and America. This was a this was quite a scandal at the time. It was a huge news. This is a front page news item. Um, and the poor man wasn't a Baha'i and it was just very distantly Baha'i. It was just a fanaticism of the Persians that made him 
uh, kill. So there was a very big uh, conference in the British Empire that was taking place. And these are two letters written by Shoghi Effendi on the 6th of December and the 9th of January, helping the Baha'is prepare for uh, the Baha'i exposition in this very important uh, conference called the Conference of Living Religions. So all the active religions in all the British Empire, including all of these sects of Buddhism and Hinduism and then uh, um, Christianity, Islam, everything that is in the British Empire, any religion that is actively practiced in the British Empire, the Baha'is were going to participate. And it was very important for uh, Shoghi Effendi to make sure that the, the preparations were adequate. So this conference took place between the 22nd of September and the 3rd of October, and was very important. Uh, there were two papers by the Baha'is, The Baha'i Influence on Life by Mr. Ruhi Afnan, and The Baha'i Cause, read by Mountford Mills. Um, they were in the actual program, you know, and uh, this is a poster of the exhibit. Uh, and it was the first big, big, big uh, event in, uh, in, um, in Britain in terms of publicizing the faith. Uh, and so I believe there's a, just a couple more stories. We're, we'll be done in a couple of minutes. Um, 21st of November, 1924, Dr. Eslamont because, becomes Shoghi Effendi's secretary. And again, uh, I chose this picture because Dr. Eslamont is just so handsome. And I love the fact he's sitting on this lawn chair and just reading a paper. I just love it. I love Dr. Eslamont. He is so faithful and loyal and dedicated and intelligent and literary and amazing and kind and loving and compassionate and empathic. And he was of so much help to Abdul Baha and so much help to Shoghi Effendi. And in January, 1923, the growing volume of correspondence forces Shoghi Effendi to write to the Baha'is of London and says, the presence of a competent assistant in my translation work at present in Haifa would be most welcome. So Dr. Eslamat, Shoghi Effendi's close friend, who is a physician, he is a doctor. He was the he was the head of a big sanatorium in Bournemouth in Sussex. He's going to come and be his secretary, a doctor, a physician. Uh, Dr. Eslamont lived to serve. Not only was he very thorough, he was extremely efficient in his work. When he was translating the writings, he would spend hours over how to translate a single word. And he helped Shoghi Effendi with the translation of the Tablet of Ahmad. So that beautiful translation, we owe it to Shoghi Effendi and Dr. Eslamont, the hidden words and other writings of Baha'u'llah. He was an ideal, ideal secretary. And this is how Shoghi Effendi described him. His tenacity of faith, his high integrity, his self-effacement, his industry and painstaking labors were traits of a character of the noble qualities that will live and live forever after him. To me personally, he was the warmest of friends, a trusted collaborator, an indefatigable collabor counselor, a lovable companion. I just love that. Shoghi Effendi, uh, throughout his ministry, encouraged many, 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 many Baha'is who had been alive in the time of Abdul Baha um, and Baha'u'llah, if there were uh, those rare ones that still were alive, to write their memoirs. And this young man made soup for Baha'u'llah's caravan when they were going from uh, Baghdad to Samsun and then took a boat to Istanbul. He was also one of the seven Baha'is who murdered the three Azalis and ended up in prison. But because he was a cook, he could come in and out of prison because he had to cook at the house of Abdul Baha. And so he wrote his um, his memoirs because when he attained the presence of Baha'u'llah, he was about 13 years of age. And he spent his whole life with Baha'u'llah and then Abdul Baha. So this is just an example of one of the people that Shoghi Effendi really um encouraged uh, to write his memoirs. Um, this is the last story. I kind of wanted to talk about this because Muni Rehanum, the, the widow of Abdul Baha, is the grandmother of Shoghi Effendi. And it, it's very rare to find any story where she even shows up in the life of Shoghi Effendi. And I found one and I just jumped on it and, and had, to, had to just include it because Muni Rehanum held fast to the covenant while her entire family just became covenant breakers. In December 1924, she wrote a letter in her own hand to Shoghi Effendi, 
addressing him as Hazrat Shoghi Effendi, His Highness Shoghi Effendi, and Gauhari Pak, pure pearl, as her dear soul, as the beloved of both worlds, as the one chosen by the master of the inhabitants of the world. And in her letter to Shoghi Effendi, Muni Rehanum explains that she would be far away for a few days as per her doctor's orders, and she would be deprived of seeing him. And she included <laughs> such a sweet gift of a soft blanket that a friend had gifted her. Before ending the letter, Muni Rehanum beseeches Shoghi Effendi to pray for her that she might die faithful and steadfast, saying she wished, quote, to leave the world with an assured heart, complete faith, absolute detachment and utter sincerity, and stating that this was, quote, her highest aim, dearest wish, ultimate hope, and cherished desire. This is Muni Rehanum. She is the only member of the Holy Family who has written an autobiography and letters of lament. She was a talented writer. All of her works are available on the internet. I really urge you to find them. This is the end of today. I'm just going to show you what's uh, in store for next week. Um, the Guardian Part 7, 1925 to 1927, Queen Marie of Romania. Thank you to everyone on YouTube, Facebook, and on Zoom. And I will see you next